Hi everyone, welcome to Outgrow's Market of the Month. I'm your host, Dr. Saksham Sharda. I'm the creative director at outgrow.co. And for this month, we're going to interview Philip Huey Bonhoa, who is a partner at Slope. Uh, thanks for joining us, Philip. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be on. So we're going to start with a rapid fire round just to okay. break the ice. Uh, you get three okay. passes in case you don't want to answer a question. You can just say pass, but try to keep your answers uh, to one word or one sentence only. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So the first question, how long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? 20 minutes. Okay. Most embarrassing moment of your life. Ooh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours of sleep can you survive on? Uh, five. The city in which your best kiss of your life happened? Boston. Okay. Pick one, Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey? Mark. The first movie that comes to your mind when I say the word ambition? Social network. Confirmation bias there, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When did you last cry and why? I cried over a tragic incident that happened with a, a close family friend. Okay. Uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay. The biggest mistake of your career? Pass. <laughs> How do you relax? I cook. Okay. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Uh, I drink tea. Okay. Uh, two glasses usually. <laughs> okay. A habit of yours that you really hate? Sleeping in. Okay. The most valuable skill you've learned in life? Leading by example. Mm -hmm. Fill in the blank. An upcoming marketing trend is blank text okay your favorite netflix show chef's table <laughs> i thought you were gonna say pass <laughs> but <Yeah>. okay <laughs> all right so that's the end of the rapid fire round you scored 10 upon 10 <laughs> and yeah. uh, now we're going to go on to the bigger questions and the first one is uh, how has influencer marketing developed over the years and why do you think it has been so successful? Mm. Yeah, I mean, good question. So I'd say the way it's developed over the years, um, I think on multiple platforms, uh, it, there's been, you know, influencer competition. So I'd say initially, you know, where I was seeing probably four or five years ago, the majority of influencer marketing happening was on, you know, Instagram and, and YouTube. Um, I think, you know, now there's many other outlets where creators are able to monetize, you know, on platforms like TikTok, um, Snapchat, even brands are paying, you know, a significant amount of money to work with these creators, um, you know, on those platforms. And uh, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, well, the second part is why do you think it has been so successful? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's been so successful because Gen Z is becoming, you know, more and more of a mover in the economy. Um, for this younger generation, you know, creators are what you know Hollywood celebrities were for you know older generations and and boomers mm -hmm. even um, the type of creators that exist presently. You know, they're able to really define a niche and kind of create this cult audience. Um, a lot of these uh, you know, creators have somewhere between two hundred to five hundred thousand followers. Um, but, you know, they might specialize in something, you know, extremely specific, such as, you know, deep sea fishing, for instance, which is mm -hmm. you know, completely random. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a market for people who are obsessed with deep sea fishing, right? Um, but beforehand, there weren't necessarily celebrity figures that one could relate with or, you know, even interact with um, at, you know, a, a larger scale. So I'd say like that kind of pocket of mid-level influencers that have, you know, a really specific domain that they are, you know, experts in. Uh, has caused, you know, I guess just the rise of creators to become like wider reaching. I'd say, you know, beforehand celebrities of, you know, the past, they were movie stars and, you know, they were, they were known for one thing, but now there's, you know, the opportunity to you know, discover, you know, these creators and influencers um, that, you know, have what I'll call domain expertise. 
um, and that just didn't exist before. So the market is much wider now. But don't you think that because there's so many influencers out there now, it is also a tougher competition to be an influencer? Like, isn't the influencer market saturated to a certain extent? You know, I'd say that um, it's definitely become more saturated. I don't think it's nearly reached a point of saturation. I mean, I think you know, there's a lot of companies and startups that are innovating to you know make it easier to to survive as as a creator. That um, if you're you know not the David Dobricks or like Logan Pauls of the world, you know you're <laughs> able to monetize and make a living. I think you know Patreon's a, a perfect example of that, where you know there's influencers with, you know, the most specific niches that are able to, you know, do pretty well because, you know, they provide value add services um, for, you know, monetary exchange, be it, you know, private cooking lessons or um, other creators on Patreon who will just post extended footage or bloopers of their YouTube content. And they have you know, such a devoted following that people are willing to pay for that stuff. Um, I definitely don't think it's saturated yet, though, uh, because we're starting and continuing to see the rise of, you know, more creators. And unfortunately, I think, you know, the creator life cycle is you know, relatively short. Um, it, it's hard to sustain as a creator. I think there's, you know, multiple reasons for that. There's like the personal mental reason where a lot of these individuals are younger and they might not be equipped um, to, you know, be able to do this long term. Um, but I think with all things, you know, celebrity and spotlight, there's a, a, a shorter life cycle for the majority of these individuals. And as soon as, you know, one of them, quote unquote, becomes less relevant, um, there's, you know, uh, a queue waiting of people waiting to kind of like fill that spot. Yeah, definitely quite like celebrities then because the yeah. comparison you were making earlier. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so to shift the question a bit, what makes a backers growth, uh, different from any other marketing agency? Yeah. So, you know, when I started Abacus, um, the initial intention and impetus was to service B2B businesses. Um, and, you know, consumer tech companies at the early stage, uh, when, you know, my partner and I were getting going, it was, it was, it was going really well, but, um, you know, we were working with some you know, pretty high caliber, you know, high, high expectation startups. And you know, that's not to say that that's bad by any means, but it's really hard to efficiently scale, um, you know, an agency and services model in working with startups because, you know, there's two things going against you. One, um, you know, startups don't have the most money. Um, so it's, it's harder for them to, to justify you know, paying for, for, for agency services. Um, you know, I think the, the second portion of this is the fact that um, aside from these uh, agency, like the way agencies scale, I think, you know, the costs for agencies, like to, for it to make sense, you know, these startups are able to find an intern or find uh, an individual that uh, can join the team even part time at like, you know, cheaper cost than the agency. Um, so that was kind of the initial impetus of Abacus. Um, and we eventually pivoted to e-commerce where we were doing a lot of, you know, paid media and that led us to TikTok where, you know, our Facebook rep got pulled over to the head of the agency program. You know, we were one of the first people on that platform, uh, were able to really kind of, you know, figure out the, the, the code or crack the code essentially, um, to be able to succeed on that platform. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, kind of a combination of you know, myself, you know, being from LA being friendly with a lot of these creators who are, you know, large on the platform, being able to pair them with the right brand and then, you know, take our media expertise to deploy capital effectively um, was, you know, the, what made Abacus special eventually. So, so what, could you give me like a trick for TikTok that you usually give your clients? Yeah. You know, I'd say one thing is depending on the type of content you're putting out or whoever you're working with, I'd say that there's kind of two buckets that, you know, TikTok content falls into when you're trying to promote a brand. Um, there's the organic side, whereby you know you have someone who just really enjoys your product and they somehow place it in a meaningful fashion. Um, and you know, repurposing that content is always you know extremely beneficial. I'd, I'd say you know if you have a brand right now, there's still a massive arbitrage opportunity to you know do quote unquote do TikTok well, meaning you know continuously post content and you know eventually the content is going to start sticking. And your brand is going to start amassing a following on that platform. You'll eventually find your tone and you'll be able to replicate whatever that type of content is. And I think on the ad side of things, like what we saw, saw early on in Abacus, what we're still seeing is that you know, a lot of brands are bringing over what they know on Facebook and Instagram to TikTok, which is, you know, studio quality creatives. Here's how I'm going to deploy my ads and the ads manager similar to Facebook. When in reality, TikTok is, you know, you have to throw all that knowledge out the window and um, kind of approach it differently. 
uh, you know, TikTok is UGC forward. And I think that, uh, you know, the audience on the platform has an interesting, uh, I guess, mental framework when they're on the platform because they're not being prone to advertise being advertised to unlike a Facebook and Instagram where you expect to see really quality ads. So, you know, that kind of presents a challenge and an opportunity whereby you have this very curious audience, but they don't want to be advertised to. They want to see like authentic user generated content. So, you know, in working with you know, your team or if you're working with a creator on the platform, I'd say it's extremely important to, uh, you know, firstly make a TikTok that, you know, the creator or the person would, you know, think would go viral in and of itself. And, you know, don't be didactic about speaking about the product, right? You want to place it in a meaningful way and you want the product's value to be shown in a way that actually entertains someone. Um, so that's like the, probably the most important thing to keep in mind when making content on that platform. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, what would you say one should do when they're going about, you know, choosing a particular creator to partner with? Yeah. I mean, I think this kind of aligns with what I was saying earlier, whereby, you know, these creators have carved out very specific niches and like, you know, specific audiences. Um, you know, creators on TikTok have a very particular tone um, and they, you know, to do well on that platform, you have to post a very consistent style of content. Um, and, you know, that typically lends itself to understanding, you know, you see a creator who posts, let's say you have a fashion creator um, that posts videos that would, you know, you assume would resonate very well with, call it 20 to 25 year old, you know, women on the coasts, um, identifying creators that make content that you think would align with whatever your ideal customer profile is or whatever your customer persona is, um, and finding those creators really is kind of the first way that we'll look at matching creators with brands. So, um, you know, creators that create content for what you know is your ideal customer profile typically does really well. And then, you know, I test within there. Um, there's a lot of different beauty creators that, um, you know, have a specific target audience that may, might align with your beauty brand, for instance, but their styles might be a bit different. One might be a bit more comedic. The other one might be more, you know, DIY, like kind of makeup hacks or whatever that may be. So I'd recommend, you know, taking the whole gambit of those creators and testing the different content styles to see what works best with your brand. Yeah, okay, yeah, that definitely works. And how is it in any way, or if you think there's a difference uh, in when, when someone is choosing a creative for Instagram versus when someone is choosing a creative for TikTok? Sorry, um, I didn't get the last part of that. You said creative for Instagram versus creative for TikTok? Uh, when someone is choosing a creator for TikTok versus they're choosing a creator for Instagram, what would be the key difference in the, this case? You know, I'd say the, the the key difference would probably be price. In in, in all <laughs> honesty, um, if you're if you're if you're price sensitive, I think you know Instagram rates are much more expensive than TikTok rates for creators. Um, you can get you know much much cheaper CPMs on on, on the TikTok platform, um, whereby on Instagram, you know, uh, it's it's a bit harder to to do well there because there's a lot of saturation with you know creators posting ad content cons consistently. So you know what I would look at is more from a concrete perspective, like if you're picking a creator on either platform, first of all, look at their engagement across, you know, all of their posts. If they've done any, you know, paid work before with other brands, you know, ask them candidly how that's gone. Uh, check out their media kits you know, make sure you're just getting a good rate. Um, it's really kind of apples and oranges with the, you know, two creators on the different platforms, but, you know, with Instagram as well, I would kind of take a similar approach by, you know, trying to find a creator that does speak to whoever you're, you know, ideal customer is so um not the not the most like clear-cut answer but um i would honestly recommend if you're looking to spend a lot of money on instagram uh, i i make the argument that that your dollars can go much farther on tiktok and you know i'd also preface that with the fact that you know a lot of brands when they hear me say that they immediately have the assumption that tiktok is this platform for you know extremely young individuals but um you know we're starting to see now more than ever um, you know, the second largest portion of individuals on the TikTok platform are 25 to 35. And it's only a few percentage points less than their main cohort of users, which is, you know, 15 to 20. So uh, definitely don't, don't count TikTok out for that. And the 25 to 35 demographic on TikTok is extremely uh, trigger happy when it comes to buying if you, uh, if you present something well. Sean, what do you think of Clubhouse? Is there any of your clients who are interested in, you know, marketing on Clubhouse? You know, haven't done any marketing for brands on Clubhouse yet. You know, I'm on there every now and then. 
um when i'm on the east coast it's a bit harder because most of the conversations are on the west coast and it gets much later here um but you know i think it's a brilliant platform and you know i will be remiss to say that you know eventually there's going to be definitely a strong cohort of individuals that are on that platform you know getting paid to speak about specific things um i've you know already seen brands host their own rooms um to speak about you know something potentially tangential tangentially related to their brand um, but, you know, they do a good job at you know, bringing their brand um, into into the conversation. But, you know, as Clubhouse becomes more and more of a, of a widely used platform, um, I mean, we're, we're going to see a lot more uh, marketing done on there. I could even see webinars becoming a bit more obsolete and moving over to platforms like Clubhouse as well. Sure. I think as Clubhouse takes the mantle of being the new social network in the hood, uh, I think TikTok is going to become more mainstream. I mean, it already is mainstream, but I think yeah. it's going to be more established now that this mantle of a new social network is going to pass on to someone else. So I think right now would be a great time to actually advertise on TikTok or like, you know, work on TikTok because, you know, the newness has gone from it, like the because people weren't sure whether it's going to last. But now we've all established that it is going to last. So yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah, there's something ahead. interesting about the psychology of individuals on TikTok as well. Like, you know, Facebook and Instagram, and we'll just focus on Instagram for now. You know, when you go on Instagram, you kind of know what you're going to get in your feed, right? You know that, uh, you know who you follow, you mm -hmm. know the accounts that you interact with frequently, and you know that you're going to get some pretty targeted ads, um, and they're going to look good, and you're probably going to click through on some of them. But, you know, on TikTok, the kind of, I guess, the, the way you, the, platform and the application is set up is much different, right? When you first enter the application, you're dropped into this thing called the for you page, which is essentially a feed of, you know, people that you probably haven't interacted with or haven't seen before. So there's a kind of this inherent nature of discovery on the platform when you, you know, are first getting on, uh, that I think, you know, sets up the psychology in an interesting fashion for users such that if you are able to, you know, intrigue them or entice them with the product in a, in a tasteful way that doesn't beat them over the head with the fact that it's an ad, um, you know, the, the curiosity is, is, is a little bit more heightened in nature. And, you know, one thing we see across the board um, in our paid media arm um, is that, you know, click through rates on TikTok are, you know, 2x, 3x of that of Instagram, Facebook. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of lends to the nature of discovery that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a bit of research on you and we found out you're a history major. Uh, so how did you end up in digital marketing? Uh, what's the story? And do you see marketing and, you know, all these social networks uh, from a historical perspective sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> funny <laughs> question. I, the reason why I was a history major is because I, I wanted to get better at writing. Um, you know, I thought, you know, I think commanding, commanding words is an extremely powerful way to market. Um, and then there is kind of the more macro level whereby, you know, history repeats itself and humans trend in similar fashions. And uh, to look at, you know, even in the past five years, the way we've seen people go from, you know, Instagram was groundbreaking in the sense that, you know, people were just posting beautiful pictures all the time. And that led to ads being static imagery. And, you know, we saw carousel ads and then we saw, you know, a very rapid transition to video converting much better than static image. Um, and now we have a platform like TikTok where, it's even shorter form content than the type of video content that was doing well on Instagram and Facebook beforehand. So, you know, being able to step back and kind of, you know, identify and acknowledge these trends and, you know, potentially pair it with history, I thought was something that would potentially be advantageous. But um, ultimately, there wasn't a, the most rhyme and reason that went into the decision to, <laughs> to be a history <laughs> major. All right. So Forbes 30 under 30, uh, what's next for you after this? Um, yeah, I mean... You know, myself and the other two partners at Slope are um, doing some pretty interesting stuff on, you know, the in investing front. Also, you know, building out some software um, for our own agency that, you know, hopefully we can eventually help other agencies with. Um, but I think, you know, aside from continuing to, to grow the agency and trying to make clients as, as satisfied as possible, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple other projects that we're working on that hopefully we'll be able to talk about soon. And, um hopefully people will be able to use soon. And was there any particular process or what's the story about being uh, in the Forbes 30 under 30? Like, how did you get about uh, getting there? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was honestly kind of random. Um, we, uh, one of our friends, 
myself a little more context myself and the two other partners known them for for quite a bit of time and we have a lot of you know overlapping friend circles and one of our friends who was a uh, past under 30 um said that he had nominated us um i think not uh a week or two later we got an email from from forbes asking to fill out some information um we filled out the information got a little excited and then i think a few months went by <laughs> kind of thought nothing much of it after that um and then you know the list came out we weren't even i thought we would be notified if we were on the list you know ahead of time or something like that but found out the, the morning it came out so um there honestly wasn't much that went into the process aside from you know getting lucky and uh thankfully forbes was able to acknowledge some of the work we've done which is fantastic all right so the second last question is what are some marketing tools that you've seen success with uh in the past few years yeah, marketing tools. Oh goodness, there's a there's quite a bit. I'm a big fan of ClickUp. So for like internal organization, um, we also use it with our clients. Uh, in terms of you know other marketing tools that are extremely helpful and that we use in our stack, um, there's a tool called Supermetrics, which helps with you know kind of automated reporting. Um, definitely you know, freed up a lot of people's times and kind of kept things cleaner. Um, in terms of you know like email marketing. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Clavio and also a tool called Campaign Monitor. Mm. Um, there's also a tool called Glock Apps, which is phenomenal for email marketing because it gives you your, uh, your your like spam score, if that makes sense. So you know if you're landing in the inbox or not. Um, that's been an extremely helpful tool for our clients. Um, and then aside from that, uh, you know, ads managers of of all the platforms are things that we rely upon tremendously. And uh, there's actually a, a new tool we've been using called Hashtag Paid. Um, mm. which is uh, an influencer marketing tool. Um, and I know our influencer team loves it. So um, I think that those are the, the probably the main tools that I... Yeah, the founder of Hashtag Paid also was in the Forbes 30 Under 30, the same list uh, this yeah. year. And we're going to interview him as well. So interesting <laughs> how these worlds collide. So the last question is, uh, what would you be doing if not this? Mm. I mean, realistically, I would I would probably be um, working on software or in venture. Um, in an alternate universe, I'd potentially be a chef. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in a culinary family, um, worked in kitchens when I was younger. Um, something that I definitely want to return to eventually, but um, wouldn't want to change much about what's happened thus far because I'm I'm having a I'm having a blast with slow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this month's episode of Outgrows Market of the Month. That was Philip Hui Bonhua, who is a partner at Slope. Uh, thanks for joining us, Philip. Thank you for having me. Uh, enjoyed it. Do check out their website for more details and we'll see you once again next month with another Market of the Month.